Long range tank which more than doubles the fuel capacity. So an aeroplane like this could fly from the south coast of England down to about Lyon in France, land in a field, do the business, take off again and come home with adequate fuel reserves, which is quite something. This was pre-GPS, of course, and, uh, and they flew at night because they would be shot down if they flew by day, uh, hence the colour. Um, some of them were all black, some of them were mostly black but with a light grey upper camouflage because they stood out like a sore thumb to night fighters in the winter when there was snow on the ground. <coughs> um, so the way they navigated was um, all done by pre-computation by the pilots and what's called dead reckoning, deduced reckoning of where you must be. Um, and they would have maybe two or three really good fixes planned. So the first one was crossing the French coast. The next one would be crossing a major river, probably the Seine, depending on where they're going. Next one, the Loire. Uh, and there would be some feature on the river, whether island or a fork or something, that was unique. And they would navigate between those two points. Um, and between the two points, just fly a heading until they saw their fix. Um, if they went into cloud, they just maintained the heading. And when they got to the time, when they should be at the fix, they looked for it. If they were still in cloud, they turned onto the next leg anyway. <laughs> Um, and then just waited for a break in the cloud. Um, once they got to the final fix, they did a um, what's called a, a, an IP to target run, initial point to target, a, a relatively short leg from a really important fix that you can't mistake, and then you time on a certain heading for a certain amount of time, um, and then you should be over the field. And as they approached the field, the guys on the ground would hear the engine, and uh, they would light a torch. Um, and they would be, in Morse code, sending a particular letter in Morse that had been agreed um, beforehand over the, those sort of personal messages that went on on the BBC. Um, the pilot would be looking for that letter. If he got the right letter, he would send the appropriate reply. And then the uh, guys on the ground would lay out the landing lights, which were three torches. Um, one where he wanted to touch down, one 200 yards further up into wind and one 50 yards to the right of him. And he would land by the first torch, the first torch just on his left side, roll between the two, turn right, taxi back to the first torch, turn into wind. He would then draw his revolver mm -hmm. and wait to see who came up the steps. <laughs> <laughs> and if he didn't recognize him personally, the brief was to shoot him. I don't think it ever happened. But basically, all the people that were in charge of the landing sites all came to UK and were trained on how to set up airfields. So the pilots and the guys on the ground knew each other personally. Um, whilst that was going on, the two agents in the back would throw their bags out. The agents that were coming back would throw their bags in. The agents that, that were in the cockpit stowed the bags, climbed out. The next two agents that were going home climbed in. It was a well-rehearsed thing that they practiced at Tempsford until they couldn't get it wrong. It would take about a minute and then the airplane was off again. Um, so uh, it was a well-rehearsed um, process. They did lose one or two, um, very rarely to uh, being captured on the ground by the, by the Germans. They were lost to being lost, weather and uh, night fighters. Um, there is a, an apocryphal story that's recorded where an aeroplane stuck in the mud and then he landed. Um, so the air crew, um, or the pilot, was taken away down the escape lines, but the aeroplane was stuck in France and of course the Germans found it. So the Germans employed some local contractors to tow the aeroplane to the nearest airfield, um, which they duly did. What the Germans didn't realise is the contractors they employed were the guys that were on the field the night before. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, they towed the aeroplane towards the airfield um, where there was a level crossing on the way and their tractor broke down. When the Lysander was on the main railway line between Paris and Lyon and it got destroyed by an express train. Um, so there, there's the Lysander. To fly it's odd, it's quirky. You have to um, use really large forces, particularly in pitch, because um, it's a very stable aeroplane. Um, but it is actually pretty manoeuvrable, and you'll see that in the display hopefully later on.
<clears throat> so there we go. That's uh, I've done my brain dump of Lysander. <laughs> if, if, um, if you have any questions, I'll uh, be happy to try and answer. Have you flown in formation with the second Lysander before? Um, personally, I have. Um, at Dutchford, we had three together. Oh, really? Um, but we've just heard today that the second Lysander is broken. Oh, oh, dear. So we're only going to be seeing this one, I'm afraid. Oh, that's <laughs> it just happened this morning. I literally heard five minutes ago. Right. Yeah. <laughs> how, many, uh, how many passengers would it take? Right, so but it was modified to take two. Right. Normally, it was built to carry a gunner in the back. Yeah. Um, but they made a sort of rearward-facing bench seat for two. But actually, you could squeeze somebody else on the luggage rack which was facing forwards. And there is a, um, a record of a, uh, an SOE agent operating the Far East that was evacuated by Lysander. And there were five in the back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but they were smaller people. Not <laughs> <laughs> they weren't going far. <laughs> and very friendly. Yeah. With the high wing, how does it handle with, with crosswinds and landing? Um, <clears throat> It's not too bad, except that big, such a high aeroplane in the crosswind, it tends to roll and sort of t feels like it's going to tip over, but doesn't. But it's sort of slightly disconcerting, but it's, it's okay. Um, the worst thing is the, the brakes are air brakes and they have a limited um, energy <coughs> absorption. All, all the brakes at that time in the 30s were the same. The brakes were designed to help you stop when you're taxiing and uh, uh, rather than stop for landing. And so they run out of energy very quickly, and, and we call them brake fade, so they stop working. So <coughs> because aeroplanes always want to point into wind, that's their job. When you're landing in a crosswind, the aeroplane is trying to turn into the wind the whole time, so you're using one brake all the time to stop it, and eventually that runs out of energy, and then you can't stop it turning into wind. The brake stops working. So that becomes the limit, really. Huh. What sort of altitude would they have flown at? Um, I think it depended on the cloud, yeah. but probably about 5,000 would be ideal to give them reasonable view. Um, but um, they want to be able to see the ground, so they would fly lower if the cloud required that. How come the Germans never heard them landing? That's what well, it's a very quiet aeroplane, and um, there is a... Um, although they, they did land in occupied France, um, a lot of the landings were in the so-called um, Vichy area, okay, so there were not so many Germans there. Um, and uh, there was one case of, uh, not a Lysander, but an agent parachuting, parachuting in to one of these fields. And on the way down, he can hear them singing the Marseillaise on the ground, you know, the group. <laughs> and um, to help that, him find them. And when he got there, he goes, sure, 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 you know, the Germans are here. And they said, there are no Germans within 50 miles of here. <laughs> oh, okay. So I think they, okay, they knew. But there was a double agent um, involved, a guy called Derek Hall, a French Air Force officer, who became one of these landing agents. Oh, good morning again, but ladies and gentlemen. he was uh, playing both As sides I said against before, the a very warm welcome to everybody. And he did a deal with the Germans for the Lysanders that he controlled. Places, I know. And he said, you don't welcome home. Uh, interfere with the Lysander, but I'll tell you season. when they're landing yeah, and you I'm can sure. capture the guys when right. they're down the road. Right. I have a great um, deal going on, and, uh, but first of all, yeah, so he I'd turned like it into a bit of a business. With what I call a parachute. Incidentally, he, they suspected that well, he was up to no good, and they called him back to uh, Baker Street, DCO, the headquarters of SME, to be interviewed by the boss. And the boss, who's a Dark typical English guy, gent, called um, to come to a what's his name? Buckmaster. I say, Derek Orr, are you playing both sides against the middle? And he said, Oh, okay then. And sent him back. But, uh,. A gentleman's word. Yes. As I said, this is the premier yeah. air show here go. at Shuttleworth. It's a great story. There's a book we have um, a called We Landed by Moonlight oh, yeah. <laughs> and another book yeah, called war. Black Lysander so, that you can see. It's what really worth known as it's French Indochina now. Okay, Vietnam, thank you. Of course. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. Enjoy your day. <laughs> many of the aircraft here. Dakota, of course, used extensively.